Hello, this is Dr. Caitlin Kite from the Academic Development Team. This short session on social media for scholars has been adapted from face-to-face -face sessions that I normally run in order to help people think about whether they actually want to use social media for their academic work, and if they do, how they should use it. And this is something that you can think about whether you're talking about information related to teaching or outreach or research or all of the above. So this will help you to consider whether social media use is right for you, and if so, what type and how you should approach that. I first started delivering this session because I was approached by academics who were struggling with three main issues. Most of these people were already using social media to some extent or another, even if it was just uh, having signed up for an accountant and, and they were sitting there watching what other people were doing and trying to figure out how they should leap in and get active as well. So the first thing that people were concerned about was how they balanced their private and professional selves. And this um, was embodied by not really being sure which platforms to use because they saw that some seemed to be a bit more personal and others seemed to be a bit more professional. And there was also some extent to which they were thinking about using platforms where people did mix those things and they weren't sure personally what they should do in order to find a good balance for them. So if they were on Twitter, for example, were they going to be tweeting about just their professional work or might they also reveal things about, uh, for example, their politics or their uh, hobbies in their private time. The second main issue was that they weren't quite sure how to prioritize different platforms. So academics typically are asked to do or told to do quite a lot of stuff through the institution, and this has to do with uh, outreach, with interacting with students, with networking with uh, people far and wide to get funding or collaborators, and so on and so forth. And often each of these different activities can or does involve a different platform. And so people were feeling overwhelmed and they weren't sure where should they really sink their time and energy. And thirdly, there was some question about style. So this is related um, quite a bit actually to that first point, but also thinking about just how do you talk and what do you show and how do you present yourself and what sorts of ideas are you considering and how do you go about sharing those, for example. So thinking about even just things like, are they going to be jokey or not jokey? Are they going to be quite serious? Are they going to be trying to cite things or post links? Is it going to be something where it's completely just made up of your own new content or is it going to be signposting to resources that others have created and so forth? So there are all these different things that are interacting all together and people were just feeling overwhelmed. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll have some idea about how you can start to process these questions and how you can figure out the best path through for yourself. I think the first main question is, why should you use social media professionally? And why do you personally want to use social media? And it's worth really asking yourself this question and not just diving into using a platform because I think a lot of people are pushed and so they go into something and they start using a particular thing before they've really thought about why am I doing this? What am I trying to achieve? How can I evaluate whether I'm being successful? And is this all really a good use of my time? So think about that for yourselves, but also let me give you a couple of examples in case you are on the fence and you're not sure that you actually should be using social media at all. There's a really nice book by an author called Mark Kerrigan who has written about social media for academics. And he wrote this book because throughout the course of his PhD, he blogged really intensively and shared his ideas and had interactions with people who gave him feedback and helped him develop what he was thinking about in terms of his research. And all of that experience he then turned into a book. And in that book, he thinks about all of the different reasons why social media was helpful for him and why it therefore might also be helpful for other academics who are thinking about how they can use it to further their careers, to um, engage with other professionals and also just to have a bit of fun. So the main things that he came up with, all of the categories that all the different examples he could find condensed down into were that it's useful for publicizing your work. So for example, um, talking about a paper that you've just published, so referring others to something that's been in a journal or perhaps talking about work that you are doing um, with the media already or actually advertising something to the media so many different types uh, of ways that you might publicize your work. 
It's also quite helpful, obviously, for building and maintaining your network. That's the whole idea of social media. That's why it's called that, right? So the whole idea was that you would uh, be able to find people who are doing similar sorts of things or who are doing the sorts of things that you would like to do or that you would like to learn about. And you can little by little start adding these people into your circle and either watching them from afar or eventually perhaps interacting with them and forming relationships and, and learning from them and moving on into something perhaps a bit more professional and engaged between the two of you or more than two of you. Engagement is also important and I use that term here to think about outreach so you might just purely be teaching or you might be having more of a conversation so perhaps you are looking to recruit people to take part of in a study or you are looking to uh, get some I, some feedback back from people about ideas that you've had and you're not sure which you should develop so engagement can take lots of different forms and we use that in many different ways i think in higher education and academia and that all of those kind of fit under that umbrella he also talks a little bit about information management, which is not something that I think a lot of us consider when we think about social media use. So this is something where perhaps you might set up a Flickr account or a Pinterest page or a spreadsheet that anyone can edit through something like Google Documents. And all of those are ways where you can start to compile information and perhaps seek information and contributions from other people. And you can then begin to curate basically um, a collection of things that could be quite useful for you and also quite useful for others. And I know people who have done this and that has eventually led to uh, analysis that has resulted in papers. They have done this in ways that has led to the creation of books just for fun. So there are all sorts of things you can do with this and that could plug into some of these other points above. So perhaps you create a database of images that also can act as like a museum exhibit basically for the public. So it becomes engagement as well. There are lots of different things that you could do with this technique. Next up, we have development. And this grew out of Mark's own use of the blogging activities in order to think about his ideas. And of course, he recognizes that you have to be careful about what you're saying and to whom and at what stage and IP could be an issue. But the idea is that social media can definitely expose you to new ideas and perspectives, new techniques, new ways of doing things. And suddenly that can really help in your education and help you grow and help you understand new and different things. And although he doesn't necessarily mention this, I have added fun at the end because I do think that although social media can take up a lot of time and it can be something that you think quite a lot about and you worry about sometimes and it can be a little onerous depending on how you've gone about it, it also can be really fun. It can be quite relaxing. You can make friends. You can see amusing things. You can learn amazing stuff. And all of that can be really enjoyable. So I think that if you're doing it in the right way, the way that's the best fit for you, that's making the biggest impact so it feels rewarding, it can also be really enjoyable. Here are a couple examples of the sort of thing that Mark was talking about in his book that are taken from the real world so you can see that both he and I are not making this stuff up. So on the left here, you'll see a tweet where uh, Danny Rabiotti, who is a PhD student from the UK, has sent out a survey asking people for advice about applying for an internship. And you can see that she's ha already had 50 votes at the time that I've taken this screenshot. And over the course of this, although I don't show it here, she did get hundreds of people giving her advice about her career. Now, Danny is no stranger to Twitter. She actually is the person that I was thinking about when I mentioned in, that, in the previous slide that there are people who have made whole books out of collecting data through social media. And this is what she did. So just for fun, she and a friend set up a spreadsheet where they were asking for people to provide information on certain animal behaviors that they had observed while doing field work. And ultimately, all of these stories came in and were so interesting and so funny that they ended up turning those data into a book. And they acknowledged all the contributors in the book. So people um, actually did get some kudos for having helped with this. And she has now actually gone on to create three books in a series. And all of that purely just arose from a bit of fun that she was having while using social media. And Danny is quite good at this sort of thing. And she takes advantage of things like hashtags and trending topics and uh, timely topics as well in order to get real discussions going. And she reaches out to people and really engages. And because she's done all of that and laid all of that groundwork, she does have a pretty good following. And her tweets then reach quite 
quite a large audience and get retweeted outside of her own personal circle. And that means that she is then able to really get a good exchange of information. So she's sharing to a wide audience, but she's also getting back lots of feedback that she can use for herself, as you see here. On the right, you can see another example, and here is another PhD student who's written that she's been to several conferences where she's met people who have known who she is because of interactions from Twitter, and that she's found that to be really easy for starting a conversation, which of course is quite helpful if you are, especially if you are an early career researcher trying to set up your networks and um, meet new people, and you find it quite awkward to do that in person, which I think many of us do. So this is a really nice example here of where something that you're doing digitally can have an impact on something that you also do in the quote-unquote real world. And these are things then where you're not just spending your time online goofing around, you are actually laying real groundwork and things that you can capitalize on later on. So these are just a couple of examples to show that this is stuff that has concrete outcomes. It's not just uh, stories that people tell about how social media is good for you, there can be really tangible effects. Now, I mentioned early on at the beginning that academics often have to do quite a lot of stuff online through various different platforms. And more and more, this is taking the form of what we would refer to really loosely as social media. So you can see things like Facebook and Twitter, which I think is probably what most of us first think of when we consider the term social media, but also things like uh, ORCID and Google Scholar, for example, LinkedIn, all of those are a form of social media. So is email, so is your personal web page. So some of the stuff that we consider to be really fundamental and, and universal, and everyone has to do it to some extent, that also does fall into this category, which is why you should be thinking more broadly about, you, you know, sh should I do social media? Well, yes, because we all kind of have to be on email, and most of us find that we do have to have a, a personal web page. So you're already engaged with social media. Now the key is thinking, is it all the right platforms and I, am I doing it in the right way? But the other point I wanted to make here is that there is a lot on the screen. You can see lots of buttons here and these aren't just uh, the only ones that you'll encounter. There are going to be lots more as well. And after a while, as you have to create each of these accounts because of what your institution is doing or because of a certain journal that you have to interact with or a conference that you're going to, it becomes overwhelming to have all of these different accounts and to have all of these emails coming through reminding you to do different things. And so then you need to start thinking, which of these do I keep? Or how can I do a thing on this platform that then impacts over here so I'm getting more uh, bang for my buck, so to speak? And that's what we can start to do on this slide. So here I've taken a subset of those different platforms from the previous slide, and I've started organizing them. So I've taken out the ones that I think are probably going to be most useful in publicizing your work. So you can see that quite a few things have been uh, removed here. So Facebook, for example, YouTube, no longer here. So these are a bit more professional. If you had a different audience for publicizing your work, you might find other examples that you think would be better here, but I've just chosen a few to show that you can start to organize things in your mind in terms of how you're going to approach and what you're going to do. Let's say you're more interested in building and maintaining your network. Well, here we've extracted a different subset of those different platforms. And some of them are the same as publicizing your work. So you could see where actually you could do one thing and it would have two purposes, but others are quite different. So maybe if, if this is your goal and not publicizing your work, then it is the case that you're going to be um, blogging here, for example, or you're going to be worrying more about um, your Facebook activity. Next, we've got engagement. And as you can see here, probably you're already seeing the pattern emerging. I'm using those same categories from the Mark Kerrigan book just because they are quite helpful. Engagement suddenly looks quite different from those others because here we're having some platforms that are much more popular and they're much more uh, laid back and fun, for example. So we've got Pinterest, we've got Instagram, we've got Flickr, we've got podcasts. So all of these are starting to look a little bit different. And I think publicizing your work and engagement do often have overlaps, but again, in, in this categorization, publicizing your work is really more thinking about getting information out to your fellow 
scholars and to people within the academic community, whereas engagement is more the interacting um, with media and with the public and so on. So it's a bit less intense and a bit, a bit less professional per se. So you can start to see these being very different in terms of what you might produce and, and how you might go about doing that. So videos and podcasts and blogs, very different from just posting a link to an article. And finally, we've got information management. And here are some brand new ones all over again. So we've got Evernote, for example, we've got Bitly. Um, LinkedIn does appear again. And you can see that LinkedIn is now in a few of these. So you might be using it in different ways or do a single thing that actually has all of these effects. So again, just reiterating that you are approaching each of these with a very different purpose. You do have to think about what, it, what am I trying to achieve and which of these platforms will allow me to do that. And then you can start tailoring your activities and maybe ignoring certain platforms. So this is the list that you're left with. You've got Facebook and Twitter, YouTube, Google Scholar, LinkedIn, and of course your email and your web page. But I would suggest that you can then also think about something that I've mentioned already a couple of times, so hopefully it's already on your radar, and that is thinking about ways that you can really be efficient. So how can you do something once and have it be beneficial in multiple ways? Here is an example of how you might do that. So let's say that you have done something where you think the best way to communicate this and to achieve your goal is to create a film. So maybe that film is an outreach video. It's because you want to share the results to a public audience um, so that they can understand your research in a way that you're not going to be able to get across in a scholarly article. So you've taken that scholarly work and you've made a fun video to demonstrate to show so that families, children, and so on can understand these concepts. You then post that on YouTube. Well, people might just come across it on YouTube or they might not because there are millions of videos on YouTube. And so you also want to get it out there in a different format where people are perhaps following you a bit more explicitly or um, they might be able to share it more easily with each other. And so then you take that YouTube link and you post it on both Facebook, where maybe you've got a lab page or an organization page or your personal page. And you can also post it onto Twitter, where again, you might have your own personal account or it might be a lab account or it might be a departmental account, whatever that looks like. And in fact, ideally, you would have one or more of those, but then be able to get others to help you with that. So let's say you posted it yourself, but then every time you do that, you have an agreement where your colleagues will repost for you or your lab will repost for you and so will your, your department, so will your college, so will the whole institution and so on. So immediately it's not just one post, it's about six different posts. And that will help to ensure that your audience is growing because you're reaching more people than with each of those posts. So suddenly you see that the one video that you've made is being distributed to a much wider audience that's not just on that platform, they're on other platforms as well, but you haven't had to do any extra work. All you've had to do is just copy and paste that link a couple more times and you're all done. You don't have to make anything new and different for each single one of these platforms. You can imagine a similar thing happening um, over here on the right side of the screen where I've, I've indicated a personal web page, email, and LinkedIn. Now the nice thing here is that actually you can take what you've made on YouTube and put it into those things as well. So that's really efficient. You're doing a single thing and linking it out through all of those uh, five other platforms. Or perhaps this is a slightly different project, a slightly different spin. So let's say you still have that um, that new paper that's come out. And in this case, it's not so much that you want to get it out to an audience of families and children for wide popular consumption. It's more that you want to let colleagues and potential collaborators know that you've had this uh, career 
shift. You've done this new topic that you're open to interacting in in different and new ways because of that increased interest in that area. And so you want to make sure that people are aware. So, of course, you're going to go to your personal web page and you're going to say, I've published this. Um, here's my new paper. Check it out. This is the first time I've studied this thing. Really excited to find out more. And then you might take that link to your web page or to that article and you might put that in the signature of your emails. You might send an email out to a bunch of folks who are potential collaborators and say, hey, this is my new paper. Just wanted to make sure you knew it was out there. It would be great to get your feedback. Maybe we could work on a project. Similarly, you can go to LinkedIn. And on LinkedIn, you can have your URL embedded to your web page so that people will just go there automatically when they find you. Or you might have an article or an update where, again, you could say the same sort of thing you were putting in your email. So you've got options there about how much you're just letting people passively find the information versus how much you are actually going to push it out there actively to try to ensure that they definitely see it and are more likely to interact with it. And again, you could see where this would be a different spin on that same thing as in the first example, or you could have one single bit of activity all in that YouTube video where you're linking up absolutely everything. And so you make a single video and post it in five different places and you've not really had to do any extra work. So already you can see that you have options here for how you're engaging and how efficient you can be. And it might be that when you have lots of time on your hands, you can do the more um, engaging thing where you're taking more time and doing slightly tailored comments for every audience. Or if you're a bit time limited, you will just do the one thing and quickly share it with everyone and let them know how they can get more information, re uh, reach the original paper, get in touch with you in case they do want a slightly different format than what you've provided. And that highlights the idea that Overall, your message and your style should optimally be varying across platforms. You don't always have to, as I just said, you could just have the one thing and then send it out everywhere and just make sure that people can follow up by linking to the original paper or getting in touch with you if they want something slightly different. But I do think that when you are using these different platforms, there's probably going to be at least a subtle little variation in how you're sharing a link. So for example, let's say you've put your, your YouTube video up and you've got a little caption under there that says this is what the video is about. For more information, you can email me here and you have a link to your email. Go to my webpage here and here's a link to the original paper. When you go to Facebook, you're probably not just going to copy and paste that same caption. It's probably going to say something a bit more friendly and open and welcoming. So it might be like, hey guys, we haven't posted anything new for a while. So here's a really exciting uh, development. Here is my latest research. Let me know what you think. Hopefully you think this is as fun as I do. Um, obviously that sounds a bit goofy, but you get the idea. It's more conversational. However, if you're doing this on LinkedIn, it might say something like, just wanted to share with everyone uh, a, an accessible look at the most recent research that, that we've done. This is a new field for us, so it would be great to find some more collaborators. Get in touch if you like what you see. So you can see that that's more or less the same message, but there are slight variations there that allow you to use it in a little bit of a different way. So again, you can do this across all the platforms that you're using. And the idea is that even though you are mostly just copying and pasting the same link, there's going to be slightly different wording in the sentence that you use to introduce that. And you don't have to write loads. It's just really tiny stuff to signal something slightly different. And that allows you to then have the impact that's appropriate for that particular platform, which should help you to achieve the goal that you actually want to achieve and not just be um, really kind of speaking into the void and not getting the sort of response that you want. There are also some more functional and practical questions that you may want to ask yourself. So first of all, and I did mention this at the very beginning, I think, you need to know what kind of difference this activity will make to you. And maybe it's not just you personally, it's more your lab group or your colleagues, your institution to the public, whatever. That's all wrapped up in this thing that I keep mentioning where I'm talking about knowing what your goal is and thinking about how you can evaluate that to make sure that you actually are spending your time wisely and not just wasting time. It is worth pointing out that sometimes the activity won't make a massive 
difference. Maybe it is just something that you do purely for fun. You don't care about the feedback. You don't care about the outcome. It's completely personal, just um, a little hobby that you have. So for example, maybe you just like to doodle something every day and post it because it's creative, it keeps you active, and it amuses you. And you don't really care if anyone sees it. You don't really care if they interact with it. It doesn't need to go anywhere. That's totally fine. But probably if that's what you're doing, if that's what your project is, that might then be lower down your priority list. And just realizing that is going to be really helpful for you because then if you do get busy, if something else comes up, if you do need to change your style or your platform in some way, you kind of know how to go about thinking about the whole issue and how to make informed decisions. So just make sure that you have this so you can make those informed decisions when you need to. On a related note, as I said, evaluation is really important. And in order to evaluate something, you need to get a sense of what it looks like if you've done it well. So as I said, if you are just doodling every day and you don't care if anyone interacts, then you don't need to know about how many likes or how many shares you're going to get. You don't really need to know how many people's lives were changed by seeing that doodle, that's fine. But if you are trying to get more collaborators or find potential sources of funding, or if you're trying to educate the public, you will want to know are you actually doing that? Because if you're not, then you are wasting your time. And if you could do it by changing platform or changing message, then I'm assuming you would want to do that. So you would need to kind of get some data collection going so that you can figure out if you do need to modify your approach, if you do need to shift course a little bit and so on. So just as you would do for your research, think about what the outcome is you're working towards and think about how you can there, therefore work towards that and what data you can collect to see if you are making progress or not. And this is a really, really essential thing that we need to do actually in, in teaching, as well as in research, as well as in outreach. So it's really something that we should embed across all of our practice as scholars and academics. So this is just a good habit to get into and to not just think this only has to do with your research. A really obvious question is, do you have the skills that you need? If, if you like the idea of having a podcast, for example, but you aren't sure how to record and edit sound files, then you might need to take a bit of an online course, or you might need to pull up the help manual for Audacity, for example, and see if that will give you the information that you need in order to use that software for your purpose. You might want to figure out how you can make a video. But you can also think, um, if you don't have those skills, but you want to do this collaboratively, perhaps you can find someone else who does have those skills, and the two of you can supplement each other's um, techniques and abilities. So maybe if you want to approach something as a lab group, for example, or as a department, then suddenly you'll find that you do have the skills you need, even if you personally don't have them. So you might also want to have that thought process. Of course, it's important, I've been mentioning throughout, the amount of time that you're going to have. Certain platforms do tend to take more time than others simply because of what it is you're sharing. So a video, for example, does take a bit of time to record, to edit, and to post. Whereas perhaps just a tweet at 280 characters is going to be a bit quicker for you. Uh, a blog might take a little bit longer to write, whereas um, a, a collection of photographs, for example, where you just put one new photograph per day or a couple per week, that's not going to be quite as onerous. So another thing to think about if you do have options that you're choosing from is which of these is going to fit in with my scheduling and with what I'm actually capable of giving to this project. I did briefly mention IP earlier and I think that's worth reiterating here. So intellectual property may be an issue. If you are worried about sharing ideas that might get stolen, if you're working in one of the fields where people do actually look around and, and sneak from each other and then try to publish more quickly, then obviously you don't want to get too much out in advance. But if you're doing something where it's a bit slower, where often people do share and they collaborate in a different way and it's a bit safer, then go ahead and say whatever it is that you want to say. But you also will need to think about if you're working with industry partners or if you're working with other collaborators who maybe don't want you to reveal so much about the project and so on. So there may be other IP considerations outside um, those that are just relevant to you personally. 
I do also always like to point out that social media, of course, has pros and cons. And you can see here on this slide some of the pros and cons that folks have come up with in the face-to-face -face sessions when I've run these. And one of the things that I think a lot of people are concerned about is trolling, so getting bullying and criticism and abuse. And people are quite worried about how they could have um, really negative interactions, some, some of which could even lead to uh, people getting in touch with your department if they don't like your opinion, which has happened. We've seen this in the news recently here in the UK. Uh, you might feel vulnerable because you don't like being open to criticism, or you might feel vul vulnerable voicing your own criticism and then worrying about how someone then might use that against you in some fashion, for example, during a job hiring process. So those are all things that you can, again, take into consideration as you're pondering, do I want to be online? And if I am online and engaging in social media, in what fashion should I be doing that? It is worth pointing out that there are also lots and lots of pros, of course. So it is fantastic for raising your profile and for educating yourself. And sometimes you can actually save time as well as waste time. You'll see that people have listed time on both the pro and the con side. So there are, just, there are lots of things here that you absolutely do need to be thinking about as you're going into this and, and be aware of how this could impact you. And perhaps if you are just starting off or if, or if you're starting off with a new project, you can put in a series of points where you're going to stop and evaluate and see, you know, how is this going? Do I like this? Is this working? And then if it's not, you can back away from it again. You don't necessarily need to dive in all in one go, but just be aware of this and, and do think about these things. Um, Charles Darwin famously used to write pro and con lists for everything that he did, including even considering getting married. And I think that actually, although it seems a bit intense, it can be really useful. So you can, you can do this yourself and think about for your own personal situation and the project that you're considering, the goals that you have, and the different platforms that you're thinking about, what are the pros and cons? And that might help you to come to a decision about what you're going to do next. So if you have decided that there are enough items in the pro column and few enough in the con column that you're going to continue, you will already be thinking, what do I need to do next? And I think a lot of that does involve training. This session has been talking really broadly, obviously, about social media and how to approach thinking in a really general sense. But once you started selecting your platforms, you're going to need to know how to optimize your behavior there. And I know I haven't covered that, but you'll want to know things like hashtags and how to deal with time zone differences and how different user patterns vary, um, different sorts of visual techniques for making eye-popping content, how to reach out to influencers, all that sort of thing. And those are things that you would need to get more platform specific training on. Likewise, if you need to know things like how to make a video or how to edit audio, as we talked about before, you might need to get some help there. If you are after something like bespoke project advice, um, there are lots of people at the institution who offer that sort of thing. And they also could to some extent help with the platform specific and support skills training. So these are people who do engagement and outreach, um, folks in IIB, for example, folks in the communications team. And I'm also available to help if you'd like to bounce some ideas off of me. I have mentioned media training, which I know is perhaps slightly tangential to this, but I do think that all sorts of communications training start to hit on certain issues that are helpful regardless of platform, and that the more you become comfortable with communication in general, the better you're going to be able to tackle any kind of specific project or specific platform. So I would suggest taking advance of that, taking advantage of that if, if you're uh, able to. If you do want to dip your toes into the water, I think it's a really good idea to update what you've already got and to make use of things that you already have. So for example, if you've got a web page, think about how you can update that to make it look a little bit jazzier, a little bit more current, to link out to other projects that you're doing and other platforms you're using and so on. If you have a video that you made a couple of years ago for something, can you think about perhaps re-releasing that now, but using Twitter or Facebook, which perhaps you didn't use before? So just think about what you've already got lying around that you could begin to experiment with so that you could get a sense of, do you like that platform? Is this working for you? And so on. You might then start thinking about planning your future work. And again, we do have experts that can help you with this at the institution if you don't want to do it on your own. 
I have a couple of templates I put together that might you might find useful. I also have some fu future reading that you might want to look at. All of those things are in a folder that I will post alongside this video so that you can make use of those. And if you find any extra resources, let me know and I can put them in the folder as well. Because all of that sort of thing can start to give you some experience with different ways that might work for you for laying out your ideas, for approaching the platforms, for making decisions, for project managing really, and for thinking about how you can then tailor to specific audiences and specific platforms. So I would suggest that some combination of all of these would now be your next steps. There are some of these things that are addressed in the videos I have alongside this, although I know that those are all quite um, luxury because they are just the lecture bits extracted from more active sessions. So if you do want something that's a bit more hands-on, it's a bit more practical, you might want to check out that folder or get in touch and look into these other opportunities as well. But I hope that's at least been a helpful introduction. It's given you some things to think about and some ways to start off your project and hopefully you'll be able to put that to good use and get some good engagement and some strong evaluations at the end.